My name is Vineet. This is my second session of the day. It's my honor and privilege to be here. Uh, this is like a whirlpool of intellect for a journalist. And uh, I've just been getting immersed and inundated in it. And so much to learn and so much to talk about. All right, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our uh, panelists for the next session, which is, is multipolarity the future of the world order? We'll start with Dr. Abhinav Pandya. He's the founder and CEO of the Usanas Foundation. He specializes in South Asia, counterterrorism, Islamist and right-wing extremism, the India-China conflict, and the Kashmir conflict. He has authored two books, Radicalization in India, and Exploration of Terror Financing in Kashmir, uh, he has uh, extensively written for the National Interest USA, the Vivekananda International Foundation, the Observer Research Foundation South Asia Democratic Forum in Brussels, Haritz in Israel, the Economic Times in India, and of course, First Post. He has given lectures on terrorism-related issues to NATO officers in the Baltic Defense College, U.S. Congressional Staff Members, Central Reserve Police Force of India, the Bureau of Police Research and Development, the Indian Army and Global Policy Institute. Recently, he addressed the plenary session at the Multipolarity Forum in Moscow on India and multipolarity. He also joined the Crossroads of Peace Conference in Armenia and spoke on India-Armenia ties. In the past, he has uh, advised the former governor of Jammu and Kashmir on uh, security uh, during the critical times when Kashmir's special status, that is, of course, Article 370, was revoked. Please give him a big round of applause. All right. Second up, it's uh, Ambassador Anil Trigunayat. Uh, Ambassador Trigunayat is the former Indian ambassador to Jordan, Libya, and Malta, and is currently a distinguished fellow at the Vivekananda International Foundation. He also served as a Director General, Joint Secretary for the Gulf and Hajj Divisions in the Ministry of External Affairs. Thereafter, Ambassador also worked as a Deputy Chief of Mission in the rank of Ambassador in the Embassy of India, Moscow. He's also on Board of Advisors at the Usanas Foundation. A big round of applause for him, please. His Excellency, Jawad Alanani, uh, sir, is a seasoned economist and a politician from Jordan and is the former Deputy Prime Minister of Jordan. He has served in several high-level ministerial posts, including the Ministry of State for Cabinet Affairs and Minister of Information from 1993 to 1995, Minister of Foreign Affairs in 1998, Minister of Industry, Minister of Industry Trade and Supply in 2016, Minister of State for Investment Affairs 2016 to 17, and finally as Deputy Prime Minister for Economic Affairs 2016 to 2017. A big round of applause for him, please. Saving the best for the last, Dr. Jonathan Fulton is here with us. Jonathan Fulton is a non resident senior fellow for Atlantic Council's Middle East programs and the Scowcroft Middle East Security Initiative. He also serves as an Associate Professor of Political Science at Zayed University in Abu Dhabi, and that's where he lives as well. He has also written widely on a topic for both academic and popular publications. He's the author of China's Relations with Gulf Monarchies and the co-editor of External Powers and the Gulf Monarchies. A big round of applause for him, please. All right. On to the subject at hand. Dr. Pandya, I'll begin with you. Multipolar and the unipolar world order today. Do you think that uh, the kind of situation that we see today in terms of the gravitation that is being seen because of a number of powers throughout the world has deemed it necessary the world, for be, world to be multipolar as in comparison to when the Cold War was on and you only had the United States and Russia Either you were on that side or this side. But now, because of technological advancements, countries, in fact, specializing, traditionally, they were not specializing in, uh, you know, this whole scenario, this whole ecosystem is going through an overall. And where do you see India's role in this multipolar world as well? 
Thank you very much, Vineet, uh, for the generous introduction. Uh, well, uh, I think that uh, definitely uh, the multipolar world order is a very natural state of things. It's something which is like a given state of affairs. Okay. And given the current circumstances, I must say that the multipolar world order has begun. China and US, today they control about 30% of GDP. Back in 1950, when Moscow and US, like they were the superpowers, they controlled 88% of the GDP. You can compare 30% and 88%. Today, you have a range of middle powers, Turkey, Brazil, India, South Korea, Japan. So definitely, you cannot deny the fact that uh, US is no more the same US which it was back in the heydays of its power on oh, the early Cold War. Certainly, the multipolar world order has begun. But then the question is that what kind of multipolarity do we see? At the, in the present circumstances, I, I can say that, well, it's more of an unbalanced multipolarity. You know? And secondly, the bigger question which comes in here is that why is multipolarity problematic for the West? Why the US is, particularly the US, is uncomfortable with multipolarity? Well, I feel that this discomfort comes from a very Hobbesian understanding of the world order and human nature, where theories like the balance of power you know, and the realist school of international relations where you find that the man is destined to war and the man has a primary selfish and brutish nature. These kind of preoccupations and assumptions regarding the human nature, that uh, forms the fundamental premise of your discomfort with the multipolar world order. So I guess... Uh, any you know, disagreement with multipolarity or discomfort with multipolarity essentially comes from your lack of your inability to accept diversity. In that respect, India has its like you know acceptance for multipolarity hidden or rooted deep in its civilizational heritage. As I mentioned yesterday, that we had 16 Mahajanpadas back in the Vedic times. Those were little territorial states spread from, let's say, like the top level of the northern Afghanistan to the Bengal border or the Myanmar border. And those states were Gandhar, from where the famous Shakuni and Gandhari were there. Then Kamboj, and then you have uh, Kosal, you have uh, uh, Kuru, Panchal, Ang, no, all these different states were spread out there. They were all territorially sovereign states. They, are, they were powerful states, but they were not essentially hegemons. And there was a level of acceptance for each other. So definitely, I must say that multipolarity is not something which is problematic for uh, the Eastern, or uh, let us not even compartmentalize, I, I must say that for a very sensible worldview, you know. Multipolarity is problematic only when you have imperial designs, when you have colonial designs, and when you want to impose things. And multipolarity is not something which is uh, confined to the territorial aspect. I mean, it's also about the values. You know. Today we are talking about multipolar civilizational order. You have multiple civilizations across the world and you have to accept them. You cannot impose the same definitions of democracy, same definitions of human rights across the world. You cannot just bracket them. You cannot use the same standard for each and every part. You know? So you have to have that acceptance. And we have it still like very inherent in our scriptures, the doctrine of Anekantvad, in which we accept the manyness of reality. That is once again your acceptance and your respect for diversity and for the multipolarity. Even in Advaita Vedanta, you, know, you accept the multiplicity in the world order. Though it's, I mean, it's regarding the ultimately the Advait, the non-duality is true, but uh, definitely at a very temporal level, multiplicity is a fact and you have to admit it, you have to accept it. So that's there. Do you think yes. India accepts it? Yes, India is... Vasudev Kukumkum? Yes, India doesn't have a problem with multipolarity. And I see, I, as I mentioned, multipolarity is a natural order. But then th there are just different ways to handle multipolarity. You know? Multipolarity has its own inbuilt checks and balances. You know? And you know, in the, in the multipolar world order, the multilateral institutions will be more representative. You cannot have one or two powers dominating it. And one more fundamental question before I end my uh, introductory remarks. If we look at things closely, when exactly we had the perfect unipolar or bipolar world order? 
you see america with its all hegemonical you know status and power and authority it's being challenged by the states like iran north korea facing economic sanctions economic poverty you see what happened in vietnam what happened in afghanistan what's happening in ukraine even china for that matter after the corona this pandemic the way it has lost lost its credibility no that speaks like i mean when all sheer, they can do is just ban tiktok yeah the with the sheer brute force and sheer, sheer hard economic power will not work after what they did in galwan did india surrender no we have stood very firm we are we are engaging them very sensibly and in a very i would say you know very confident manner into negotiations we are convincing them that this fight and this kind of this posture will not work come and talk so i guess multipolarity is a natural order and one should not be uncomfortable with that and certainly we are moving towards a multipolar world order yeah. absolutely abbas daniel what are your thoughts on multipolarity taking a leaf out of what uh, dr pandey also said that you know earlier it used to be russia and usa with the hegemony but now it's usa and china but it's exactly not analogous or comparable to what existed in the 70s and the 80s well we need the i would say multipolarity is a desirable order it should be there that every power or the power that aspires to be should have an adequate strategic space to operate in a collaborative manner so it is an ideal state of affairs but let me be devil's advocate today the way we are looking at it and as abhinav also said very clearly that for a multilateral or multipolar world you need robust multilateral institutions they are totally absent what we are looking at united nations today it is not even a talk show it has totally failed in any conflict wherever the major five powers are involved especially where we have uh, the un security council is g3 versus g2 so nothing operates it works and there is no bigger assembly than that you are seeing a sprouting of a large number of trilaterals multilaterals and plurilateral organizations for a specific purpose the behind all this what is operating behind all this is operation is usa which wants to retain its numero uno status is trying to contain china that is trying to displace it and as general shukla was mentioning about the chinese strength that's growing very fast and it is not growing in a vacuum for a vacuum it is growing for a purpose to counter it on the other hand you have this russia ukraine war it is not a war between russia and ukraine it is a war between russia and united states to be precise or the west rest of the world is caught in it you don't know where it's heading i have another uh, hunch if you look at the east and west because the western supremacy they believe in alliance mindset you need alliances you have to be true to true follower only if you be part of the club country like india doesn't do that most of the civilizational powers don't do that but depending on and i caveat it with that depending on the way the russia ukraine war will eventually result what is going to happen that will decide whether we are going to be in a cold war 2.0 kind of scenario in which definitely russia and china will be on one side along with a large number of countries that support them on the other we will have us and the west with their old mindset which will continue which is a, actually on the grassroots level that is operating very much now people might say the yesterday somebody had mentioned that uh, you know the china is china is playing a very smart game china is buying time it doesn't want to get into a war right now so that it continue to have its economic strength greek galvanize it and achieves its objective it thinks 100 years in advance we cannot discount china in our strategic thinking but at the same time what i feel is that countries like you have today g20 for example 
we very successfully chaired it. G20 represents about 100 countries now. If you put AU and the EU memberships, it has become the biggest club, biggest group. It still works on the basis of consensus which we achieved. But there is no enforcement mechanism of anything. It is recommendatory in nature. Same thing applies to your BRICS. You are trying to work into an economic space. BRICS is growing. This time Russia is hoping that there will be more members, associate members or others. So you have an alternate grouping, which might be an alternate grouping to even G20. India in the context is, will find it a bit uncomfortable in the BRICS itself over time because it's becoming China-centric. So we have to really see it and I would very much want it to be a space where there is no conflict but it doesn't happen. It's an ideal world. I, As I said yesterday, I think that there would be a Cold War 2.0 kind of scenario in times to come. How soon? That will depend. Where does India stand in my view? In my view, India stands because it has a very different kind of a worldview model. As you mentioned, was Dev Kutumkam, or for that matter, strategic autonomy. So that you can act in a space according to your interests, or the national or international interests that you perceive. And in that sense, I think that very large number of middle powers, the smaller powers, the others, or countries, who are not really adequately, uh, you know, have the capacities, are looking for some kind of a leadership. That's where your voice of Global South comes. So you will see a very large number of countries. Today, the Gulf countries, for example, are very rich, but they are all uh, following this policy of strategic autonomy. They have come out with active policy. They are moving. They are Everybody is looking for choices. They don't want these binary choices, but they will be eventually impress, uh, impressed upon many countries. So you mentioned uh, the Global South. You know, and it is being touted that India is the de facto leader of the global south. Isn't that a prime example of uh, multipolarity? Well, it is, uh, I would say, uh, de facto, not de jure. It is very much there. You see, I mean, at one time we used to say we want to be Vishu Gurus, for example, right? From my postulate is, that you can be you can be called Vishuguru by your disciples. You can't call yourself I am the Vishuguru, right? Today, as far as Vishumitra is concerned, it's a very good uh, thing that we are friends to the world. So that's what we have shown through the Voice of Global South, through the uh, pandemic, and several other places where we have emerged as a major uh, first responders in various kinds of crises. So that is what is giving you a moral authority. And not only now, this has been a consistent effort by India to present the views of the countries, developing countries, across multiple fora, international fora. We have always stood for their, championed their causes throughout. You look at the vaccine time, India went ahead and asked for the uh, waiver of the intellectual property rights on vaccines. What for? Not for ourselves. We were the largest producers but for the rest, everybody else, because it's a global good, global commons, global welfare. So when you're looking at it, you are coming with a moral authority, in a way, to represent the right thing. That's how I look at India's drives. Excellent point, sir. His Excellency, you've been a seasoned statesman. You've seen the world, at least a lot more world than I have. In, in your opinion, in your subjective and your objective opinion, how would you differentiate between the bipolarity that existed since the 60s to the 90s when you know Russia was disintegrated and the bipolarity that we see today? Well, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, what, what happened when the United States became the unipolar power of the world? You know, was that the modus operandi or was it the exception? I mean, did we live in a world that was always multipolar or was it an exception that only one country seemed to have, you know, its own say? It will always get its, uh, you know, for instance, during the Iraq, uh, the, after Iraq occupied Kuwait, between, uh, in two or three months, the United Nations Security Council took decisions between, I think, 600 and something, until 7.15, and there were about 50 or 60 UN resolutions 
taken against Saddam Hussein's regime in Iraq in accordance with chapter seven of the United Nations Charter. So who, who, nobody actually in the other uh, powers of the world who had the veto, uh, you know, actually used it. Not Russia, not China, not anybody. So in a way that was to me an exceptional period. Uh, it is not something that we can actually derive lessons from for a long time. The second one is that right now we have replaced that, that uh, unipolar system with uh, its complete opposite, lack of leadership. So far, China, I have been a visitor to China at least 15 times between 1980 until now, and I have seen China change you know, over time, and it is extremely interesting to see what happens. But China until 2019 you know, or 20 was saying that we are still a developing country. You know, we average uh, per capita income in China is less than $4,000. So we cannot claim to be a superpower just because we have so many people and you add them up so that our GDP will become very big. Uh, so anyway, they were taking a very relaxed and observant role, not actually engaged in, in that. Two years ago or three years ago, I think, the Communist Party meeting, I think it was number, I don't know what, 39 or something, that for the first time, they said that we are going to replace economic, economic uh, 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 affluence, you might say, with power. And they used the word power. So in a way, China is changing its position in that, in that respect. Uh, okay, so where does that leave India you know, in, the, in the process? I mean, come on, let's be, say, if you look at the, at the uh, five, uh, uh, Russia, uh, I will talk about Russia for a minute. Russia, to me, I don't know, I, th I thought that uh, the panel to this morning, for instance, when we discussed Russia, would say that, ha could it have been before the war in, U in the Ukraine, uh, could Russia have become eventually a member of the EU? Could it have acknowledged and, def and uh, defined itself as a European country, not as an Aurelian country or an Asian country? No. So I said, okay, well, could China have done that? I mean, uh, Russia have done that. And uh, I think Russia, despite all the fact that it has uh, succeeded or, or, or at least won the war, I think, in the Ukraine, and it's too late for anybody to reverse that. Uh, but after that, will Russia be in the full definition in shortage of depend complete dependence on exporting raw materials become a natural super superpower? And can it actually sustain that? The fourth point, uh, India. Okay, India is a very, for, for a researcher, an observer is an extremely important country. And, and, and curiously, it is most interesting. <laughs> because India that I have been visiting and I have been, haven't been here in a while, I noticed a huge difference. You can almost breathe it, you know, when you enter the country. There is a different sense as you, as somebody, I think you mentioned that, said in the morning, uh, that suddenly the Indians feel, and you mentioned it, uh, Anil, also, uh, that the Indians now feel much more confident. Uh, they are not the meek, you know, personality, uh, or the the times that uh, when Krishna Menon used to go to the, you know, Himalayas and, 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 and plead for America's help, and things like that. This is not India that I know, and the contrary, Indians now are very confident of themselves, they're proud, uh, and they show that, and they show that, and they 
declare it, which to me is very good. It's very important for the psyche of the people to know that they have achieved something. And India is the only country that can claim it did that on its own. China was very much helped by the Americans. They were given access to their markets. And actually, economists always ignore the fact that the Chinese cheap production was the one responsible for controlling inflation in the world. Not low interest rates, not easy, you know, what, what they call easy uh, uh, quantitative easing and so on. <laughs> because China, when China stopped producing cheap commodities, they wanted to trade their own goods. We have seen that. But so China was helped. But India, on the contrary, pursued its own course, even in the production of milk. Even, you know, I, I, I think the story of increasing milk production, even in India, is a fascinating story. To me, it's a fascinating story. <laughs> because, you know, when the, uh, I remember this gentleman who was explaining this, said that India always knew that, the, uh, for instance, when they have the Butter Mountain, you know, in Europe, uh, the excess milk or dairy products, they gave India donations. India would not take them and distribute that milk free because that would kill the milk industry in in Bengal and in other areas in, in India. So, so the, what they did is that they sold it and made money and bought more cows for farmers to own and milk. So this is a fascinating story. To me, they had a very clear vision. I, I met many good economists from India. I met Jagdish Bhagwati, you know, I met uh, Sen and many others who were here. Ramaswamy and others, and I always, uh, they always had a vision about what India should do. And the same thing resonated when I came with Prince Hassan in 1988 to India, and we met with the late Rajiv Gandhi when he was prime minister at that time. And, uh, you know, his minister of planning, I think, gave me a book about how to develop industrial organizations in industrial research organizations in, in India. So there is, has been lots of detailed and thought through thinking of how to develop. So India is on its way to become a great power. The question that, how do you translate that now? Can India or will is India willing to take the responsibility of leading the third world, for instance, in order to assert its position vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other powers, European powers and others? This is one question. Secondly, what are, there are rewards for that, but at the same time there are costs. So has there been a study done on the future role of India? Thirdly, is India, uh, I mean, President uh, Biden in the last uh, G20, alluded, I think he, he didn't say it outright, but he alluded to the fact that India is going to be, uh, uh, you know, a permanent member, for instance, in the UN Security Council. Okay. Now, is India willing to do that role and take the responsibilities that come with such a role? These are questions that are connected with what we need badly, that is a a new international system. We cannot, you know, we, we spent two decades creating the World Trade Organization, and now it is nothing. Everybody was talking about, you know, free trade, role of uh, uh, international, uh, international, uh, uh, world, uh, world, uh, world Trade uh, uh, Organization. What happened? Where is it? Nobody hears anything about it. Its meetings happen, take place, and fizzle out without anybody knowing exactly what they had agreed on. And we are back to the basic two IFIs, you know, international financial institutions, which were created uh, during the Second World War, 1944, uh, uh, you know, after the Bretton Woods, we call them. 
And so, yes, I'm finishing. And, and <laughs> these are now part of the, of the system. The reason China <laughs> leads that is because it wants to change the international financial system. And where does India stand on that? Do you want, for instance, the dollar to continue its domination? Or do you want something else? Okay. So in a way, you know, these are probably we have more questions to ask than we have answers to, 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 to give. Thank Absolutely you. right, sir. Absolutely. Right. Coming to Dr. Fulton. Dr. Fulton, your thoughts on uh, this multipolarity that exists today. Uh, I think it's very easy to define multipolarity, but it's very, very difficult to measure it, isn't it? No, I'm an international relations prof, and I take a very dogmatic view of what multipolarity It's poles of power and influence, you know? So it's you can see this, right? You can see if there's one country that is the pole of power and influence, then that's a unipolar system. And that's a very, very, very rare thing. Um, I don't adopt any normative approaches when I think of this stuff. I don't think of it as a good thing or a bad thing or a moral thing. It's just a thing, right? It's where is power concentrated, where is influence concentrated. I don't think the U.S. had this design to take over the world as a hegemon and say, let's force everybody to be liberal Democrats. You know, there was a bipolar system that existed throughout the Cold War, and one pole has collapsed on itself, and the U.S. was left, right? It was left with the most incredible, and I think we should also consider power as being the, the accumulation of a lot of things, right? It's not just the military. It's, it's political power. It's discourse power. It's soft power. It's, you know, the, the power to convene. There's a lot of stuff that goes into this. The U.S. was in this position in 1990 that no other country's ever seen, right? Nobody had a defense budget bigger than the next 25 countries combined, you know? Um, it was a very unusual thing. Um, now, what we've seen the past... I guess really since 2003, I'd say with the, the invasion of Iraq is when you saw this start to shift, when a lot of countries rejected uh, US leadership. Um, 2007, when Putin gave his speech in the Munich Security Dialogue, when he said he was clearly done with the uh, Western liberal order, and then he immediately invaded Georgia, showing all of us that, uh, you know, Russia's goal is going back to this kind of 19th century, you know, the strongest survive, take what you can. Um, and then China, of course, I think in 2008, started to shift its approach as well, um, mostly because I think it looked at the uh, global financial collapse that started in the U.S. and thought, well, hey, this is a sign that our model works and nothing else, you know, like we, we clearly are ahead of schedule. Um, so they, they thought they could step up and, and pre pre uh, present an alternative. Now, one thing about the bipolar system that a few of my uh, colleagues here alluded to, um, countries had agency. You know, there were the two poles, you know, the, the Soviets, the Americans. Countries basically thought which set of values align with our interests. You know, is what the U.S. promoting good for us and great? We'll work with them. I live in the Gulf. Uh, most Gulf countries aligned with the U.S., not because they agreed with its foreign policy, not because they liked its uh, liberal values, but because it served their interests. By working with the U.S., they got a lot out of it. We saw the same thing in the, this unipolar period. You know, countries that chose to bandwagon with the U.S. typically did so because they thought membership gives you privileges. Um, we're at a point now where a lot of people consider China as a pole of power. India's emerging. It's interesting to me because I don't think... I've been looking at India for quite a while, thinking here's a country with a lot of obvious advantages to, to play this role. But I never really saw India asserting itself as more than a regional actor. And recently you see India adopting a more muscular foreign policy, uh, asserting its place in the world. But this is a recent thing for somebody like me who's just been watching from afar. Um, I think what we're seeing is, you know, there's, there's really only one global power, I think. And that's, that's still the U.S. China looks like a global power. Um, but again, if you look at power as a, a composite of many different things, China is a trading superpower. For sure. Is it an economic juggernaut? Do countries want to follow China's economic model? Not really. It's not a very attractive model for a lot of places. Its politics aren't that, that attractive either. Um, China can project itself as a trading power. Its soft culture, or its soft power is very non existent. Um, you know, it's not, it, it looks 
what I'm trying to describe it to my students, my students often refer to China as this, this risen global superpower. And I always think of it as a, a guy in the gym who uses a lot of steroids. So he's huge and he looks really big and really tough, but you know, he's, he's, he's sick inside, you know, he's got like cancer or something. He's not as, as, as tough as he looks. Um, one of the Michael Rubin who spoke on my panel yesterday talked about, uh, some of the limits to China's global power, you know, the fact that they haven't fought a war since 1979 when they fought Vietnam and didn't do very well, you know. Um, China's not really as militarily big and tough as it looks. Um, there's a lot of limits to what it can do. And it's just not, when you look at its neighborhood, most of the powerful countries in Asia, Japan, Korea, Australia, India, most of these countries have very serious problems with India or with China. So it, you know, to, to consider it as a, a model for other places, it's not a model in its own region. The countries that know it best are, are, are threatened by it. Um, so are we in a multipolar system? Yeah, sure. I mean, India's a, a, a pole of power and influence. China's a, a pole of power and influence. I think what we're seeing is, is a, a, a more decentered situation right now. You know, there was this era, this brief era, uh, historically, when you could have two global powers that had global interests, uh, I think what we see now is a lot more decentered regional powers. Um, I think we're really what we're seeing is just the rise of regionalism. Where I live in the Middle East, I mean, it's 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 a very competitive space. You know, at one point the Emiratis saw themselves as uh, I remember being at an event where somebody from Singapore was talking about their experience as a small state and saying, you know, and you can relate, UAE and this uh, Emirati got very offended. We're not a small state. We're a Middle East superpower, and we're a global middle power. And uh, I was like, well, man, I'm from Canada, and when I was in college, we talked about middle powers, and we're like, well, we're not a middle power. We're not that that important, right? And, you know, you can see the Emiratis consider themselves a pole of influence, Turkey, Saudi, Iran. Obviously, there's a lot of competition, you know, within one region, within Asia, there's also a lot of poles of power. So yeah, of course, you know, from looking at it as a very academic, yeah, multipolarity, absolutely. Um, I don't think that means the model that we use, we always kind of fall back to history and say, okay, China, China, um, US Cold War. I don't see it. I mean, a Cold War, a lot of countries aligned, like I said, based on their interests with either the US or the Soviets, either interests or ideology. I don't see a lot of countries doing that with China anytime soon because its ideology doesn't travel and their interests are often threatened by it. So I think what you'll see is a lot of other countries, you'll see regional groupings, you'll see, um, you know, alliances as distasteful as it might be. It's just going to be a very, very messy period. You know, I think as much as many folks dislike how the unipolar era played out, I, I think we're probably going to look back with a bit of nostalgia because uh, it was somewhat orderly. It wasn't always nice, um, but you, you knew, you knew what was, how it was going to work. And I think what we're going into now is, is just, just very, very uh, chaotic and uh, it's going to be very, very messy. And I think it's really going to be about, uh, well, just kind of real politic is what we're going into. So. All right. Well said. Dr. Pandya, considering how small the world has become because of technology and advancements in artificial intelligence. What do you think is the better option? You know, a few superpowers or multiple talented global powers? Which order appeals for the benefit of everyone? Well, I think with the advancements in artificial intelligence, I guess our whole ideas about sovereignty, you know, and uh, power, they are going to be revolutionized, you know, and power will be much more dispersed, you know, and, you know, uh, I guess, you know, I mean, with the advancements in artificial intelligence, I guess multipolarity is bound to come, definitely, you know, okay? and you, you, it won't, it won't just be the nation states, you know, which will be controlling the power, like, you know, power will be distributed even some other entities, you know, okay? global, corporate, technological companies also. So I think I mean multipolarity is definitely it's something which will be in place you know, with this. Ambassador Trigunayat, how do you see India poised in this uh, ecosystem of multipolarity? Well, I think that uh, <clears throat> uh, one thing I would like to uh, before I uh, go forward, there was a mention about India becoming a 
uh, member and assuming responsibility. Actually, I must say, and of course, Ambassador Thirumurthy is here, uh, that as far as the global responsibilities are concerned, India has displayed it, both in the UN context, global context, that it has taken responsibility, uh, maybe the peacekeeping missions or otherwise, being a founding member of the United Nations, uh, and all the other major multi-polar, uh, or multilateral organizations. So India has been very much there. Today, India does not demand uh, that, uh, you know, we, we re request that we be the member. No, it's not. India commands that position by, by virtue of various factors that everybody knows about. Uh, XYZ country supporting you, US or somebody else, saying that, okay, we support India's candidature, they jolly well know that China is not going to support. And therefore, there's no harm in getting the brownie points. So I think as a real realistic assessment, we should not bother about it. It's okay, it makes a good sound bite by XYZ country telling you that we support India's candidature, but we are realistic. And Prime Minister Modi has often said, and so has the Foreign Minister, that if these organizations don't reform, they will lose their relevance. Now, if they lose their relevance, then the backbone of your multipolarity or whatever you are talking about, uh, in a way, dissipates. And so I think that India is trying to create a sane foreign, by, through the value-based sane foreign policy, a new kind of a narrative. It is trying to say that dialogue and diplomacy must be given precedence uh, over war and conflicts. So certain kind of a moral authority that uh, the organizations were supposed to play, until and unless they adopt that, I think it will be very difficult. So India's contribution going forward, and it has been mentioned by everyone that currently we are in such a churn that we really don't know which way the world is going to play out. God forbid if tomorrow there is a nuclear war, everything else is, uh, you know, finished. So this is, uh, we just don't know. So it's easier uh, today to say. Now, technology, for example. Now, and this Cold War 2.0 is not going to be the traditional Cold War 2.0. This is going to be where the financial instruments will play a very major role. We are already seeing, courtesy this Russia-Ukraine war, that the weaponization of financial instruments have led to most countries. And I met a, a member of uh, European Parliament from France. And he was telling, he said, look, we in the France are worried. That tomorrow, if we don't agree with the U.S. on something, they will confiscate our funds, and so you lose credibility. So once the credit, so this is going to be a very different kind of a Cold War 2.0. It doesn't have to be militarily; it has to be a te technological superiority, and for which let us not discount. China is doing its utmost to get that parity somehow, and the way they are going forward, like even 5G for that matter. You might say whatever it is. But in the 5G, they were the first ones. They're already working on 6G. So, you know, I tell my Indian friends, because I always say that for India, going forward, China is going to be our major challenge in every geography, in every domain. And we need to be prepared for that. That's very important for us. So while you are realistic about these things, you, there is no issue. So I think that India will play its part. It's play a positive part bringing about sanity in the international discourse. And that's how I look at it. It will be strong militarily. That's very important for India to defend its borders. Uh, His Excellency, what happens to, you know, some of these international institutions if the world keeps gravitating towards this model of multipolarity? Will they be redundant? Well, we probably need a new paradigm. I think so. There is, at this particular uh, stage of events, uh, when there seems to be a vacuum of power uh, or lack of coordinated power to tackle the world problems, uh, as what, you know, this is a reminiscent of what happened to the League of Nations <laughs> uh, until 1919, when uh, it was established in 1919 by 1938, when Japan occupied Manchuria, uh, you know, the, the world order was, was finished. As it was represented 
by the League of Nations. So in a way, we don't want to really become again a part of that a repetition of that history. And as you know, those who don't learn from history are condemned to see it repeat itself. And so in a way, we have to learn the lesson from that. But but my my question, as far as the future, and it seems there is a consensus among the four of us here, is that the absence or the end of the unipolar world has not left us with what we would call exactly a multipolar world. We are not yet there in, 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 in the definition in, in a definite way. Uh, we are living in, I think right now, in this transitional period between what and what, I don't know. But in this transitional period, we are living a vacuum of power. And there is obviously a power crisis or leadership crisis for the world. It is a leadership crisis that we are going through. There are, I have seen, I was in Brazil, you know, and I went to this uh, architect's office. He had a big map of the world, and he showed me that there are 100 regional conflicts in the world between neighbors, saying that 30 of them on average will be active, like volcanoes, but 70 are dormant temporarily until somebody sees it to his own interest to really arouse them. <laughs> so in a way, this is very critically dangerous world. And if we uh, look at what we call proxy wars, you know, that are taking place in the world, and see how they, the dynamics of those wars is, is taken, it gives you a, a, a convincing feeling that this is a chaotic world. I mean, it's not safe, exactly. So we have, we are in dire, in dire need for a new paradigm. And that includes the institutions and their role. And also, what, what weapons do they have to, to enforce what they agree on? So far, you know, only the United Superpowers uh, created, uh, used uh, UN resolutions to create their own armies from their own people to wage wars in Vietnam and uh, in the Gulf and I don't know, in many places in the world. So in a way, there is a vacuum, a moral vacuum also. And uh, with the increase, now look at what, what we're doing about particularly environment. You know, we meet in those huge conferences, you know, in order to come to an agreement on environment. What happens as a result, you know, once the party is over, everybody goes back home. Of course, there has been some, some, some growth, some development, progress on the, uh, on the environmental issues, but still it has shown itself its nasty face in the migration Immigration, no, you know, immigration is not just a result of political conflicts. Immigration also is becoming a, a, a phenomenon of the world because of droughts and lack of water. And the world is actually very nasty to the, what I call uh, lower riparians on rivers. You know, the lower riparians are losing their rights by the upper uh, riparians because they, they have uh, control over the sources of water, while the ones where water passes by uh, are, are, are enjoying themselves. So in a way, how do we reach a world that will be competing for resources, fighting each other for re the, such resources, when the pressure, you know, any, any big country in the world, and we are, I am worried, for instance, about Egypt, you know, going, going bust, broke, uh, at a time when Egypt is too big to fail. Who is going to take responsibility for that? 110 million people. Uh, so in a way, you know, we have many challenges, hidden challenges that are waiting for us which would require us to really develop a new paradigm. 
living is going to be the most challenging threat to the future of humanity. All right. Okay. Thank well you. said, sir. Well said, sir. We only have about two minutes left in this session, Dr. Fulton. The last question I want to ask you is, are there any drawbacks to this multipolar order? Do you think it is likely to divide the world into segments and perhaps the cooperation factor might decline? Well, we're already there. I mean, I could expand, but I mean, clearly that's where we are right now, right? I mean, just looking around the world, you, you can see this playing out in real time. So yeah, I think it's going to be, like I said uh, a couple of minutes ago, I think it's going to be much less predictable. Um, I think countries have to make some pretty serious decisions about, you know, alignment partnerships and things like this, which has already played out. I mean, you look at the Indo-Pacific, which I, I've been quite a skeptic. It seems strange to me to say this region is a region when it goes from Alaska to, uh, you know, East Africa. That doesn't really qualify as a region. That's almost everybody in the world, right? So, um, but but you see how this is playing out. You know, uh, you've got China on the one hand and, and, and the kind of countries, client countries that it works with. And then you've got this, you know, grouping that that uh, opposes it. And I've been asked to do a bunch of quad events or Indo-Pacific events with the US government or the DOD or, or whatever. And it's always framed as a balance of power. And I'm like, how is this a balance? If you've got the quad with India, Japan, the US and Australia on the one side and you've got China on the other, that's deeply unbalanced, right? This is not a balance of power. Um, in fact, I think for China, it's clearly a balance of threat. Um, and this is the, I guess the thing I worry about is, is looking at it in these terms forces countries into dangerous decisions, right? Um, I keep talking to folks about, uh, Chinese involvement in the Gulf. And, um, one of the points I, I think is it does have legitimate interests there. You know, it's got a huge expat population living there. It's got commercial interests. It's got uh, a lot of contracting it does. Um, if you try to limit what China's doing there, then it's going to say, okay, well, we've been working with status quo countries like the Saudis and the Emirates, um, and, and not really being very disruptive. But if you limit their access to certain markets or certain countries, they'll go where, where, where the option opportunities are and what's left is Iran. And do you really want to see that play out with China and Iran actually becoming much more assertive together? So I think really what it comes down to is how do we find a way to accept other countries' legitimate interests and find a way to work together um, to limit the threat of uh, escalation? Dr. Fulton, appreciate that concise answer. We've run out of time, but uh, now we're going to entertain questions from the audience. Right, ma'am, right there. Can somebody please pass her the mic? After her, sir, we'll come to you. Good evening, everyone. My um, question is for Ambassador um, Anil Trigunayat. It's more of a doubt or a thought, actually. So how do you think small states or slightly less powerful countries benefit, benefit from the multipolar order to cater their own national interests? Well, basically, uh, you know, there are countries earlier, as you know, that this used to be a bipolar world. Right. So at that time, the countries were divided and then uh, countries like India started this non-line movement and all in which very large number of countries who were colonized were helped in their movements. And so they were able to get their freedom. Subsequently, their developmental journey in which the countries assisted those who were power, part of the power blocks or those who were otherwise out of the power block. So basically the countries uh, I, that's why I was saying that country like India, for example, and even China, US, everybody else, what they do is they use their developmental assistance to look after uh, the more disadvantaged countries in different formats and different uh, areas. Uh, India is one country which has uh, been providing uh, capacity building assistance and which is remarkable to an extent because we ourselves are a developing country to about 161 countries across continents. 
and not only in uh, Africa or anywhere else, but everywhere. And this 161 countries have benefited a great deal and they understand. And now that we have a policy that they want, whatever they want, we want to do it for them. Because India is in a far better position today. We don't believe in checkbook diplomacy at the time, but we continue to have the capacity building assistance so that they're able to come up to that. For example, let me just tell you, whether in the GATT negotiations, WTO negotiations, everywhere, India has been representing the cause of the developing world, basically. That's why very often India is seen as uh, being a roadblock uh, for many things because Western countries have a narrative, they have the expertise, they have the legal expertise, they are able to do things. And it's very difficult in the multilateral domain also to operate as you know, if you have to negotiate something with the European Union or with the United States, which are highly legalistic societies. So those countries, large number of countries don't have that capacity. So countries like India, which think of everybody's welfare, are there to do that. So but the thing is that choices become multiple. When you are talking of a multipolar world, then you are looking at various choices, provided you are able to exercise them. My problem is the large number of countries won't be in a position to exercise choice in a multipolar world even where do they go? Because they are not on that same developmental journey today. So that's going to be a bit difficult. So they have to choose a country that is benign power. Now, that is something that they'll have to look. And I don't see, that's why I say when there is going to be a third pole at all, willingly a large number of countries may coalesce around India's leadership. Can we please ma pass the mic to Sir here? Right here. If I could just raise two issues. One is, you know, we keep talking of the world in uni, bipolar terms. But the way it is playing out, I see two axes emerging. One axis is Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, and the other is the West. And uh, it, what should worry us is this axis is winning. It seems to be winning in Ukraine, in West Asia, potentially in, uh, in uh, the Western Pacific. And the second is, you see, uh, you know, when we talk of India's worldview, is it informed by a singular narrative of Vasudev Kutumbakar? It is informed by multiple narratives. One narrative is that of Vivekanand, who said that the world is but a gymnasium where nations come to make themselves strong, which means that while we are benign, we are also realist. So why don't we say that we are neither soft nor hard, we are a competent power? If these two issues, you know, the, the orders, and anybody could just answer. Say is that India should be, and that's rightly so. I fully agree with you. It is like uh, being a smart power. But what happens is during the uh, positioning, now we also have our own problems, and we have not reached there as yet. As far as, let's say, China, uh, we, I mean, this is a challenge that we'll have to contend with all the time. And uh, not on one geography, but in the maritime domain and elsewhere also. So that remains your major challenge. In your neighborhood also, then China continues to play a major role there. So your energy has to be invested in this area to be able to stay afloat and to be able to do it to the rest of the world. So what India is trying to do is that whatever help and assistance we can give to the large number of countries, and these are all strategic corporations also at the same time, while they may be very charitable and uh, you know looking after the welfare and all, driven by larger this thing, but the grassroots level, you want to have more and more friends. And uh, that's what precisely we are trying to do. So when the time really comes uh, to call the shots, that everybody supports you. All right. Thank you for that answer. We've completely run out of time. Big round of applause for all our panelists on stage. Thank you, gentlemen.